From time to time, architects will try to push the envelope by creating buildings that use innovative ideas and new, untested designs. However, innovative design doesn't always equal better, and sometimes these cool-looking buildings have some serious flaws. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the worst examples of this in the world. So here are the top 15 worst building design blunders in history. Starting with number 15, London's Shangri-La. While the Shangri-La is one of the most luxurious hotel chains on the planet, those staying at the Shangri-La in London sometimes have to deal with peeping toms. You see, the hotel is located inside London's famous Shard Building, and because of its unique shape, in some rooms the external glass acts as a mirror that allows you to peek into the rooms of other guests. This in turn forces some guests to put up their blinds, making them unable to fully enjoy the hotel's incredible views. Number 14. The Walt Disney Concert Hall The Walt Disney Concert Hall is a huge tribute to Disney's founder, but upon opening it quickly took some heat from locals. That's because its large, curved, and polished metal walls reflect a lot of sunlight, and these rays have blinded passing drivers and heated up the neighboring buildings by up to 9 degrees Celsius. While building architect Frank Gehry says that the reflective steel was put up against his wishes, all was solved in the end, as a two-step sanding process dulled the shine and made the heat reflection far more bearable. Number 13. The Ray and Maria Stata Center the Ray and Maria Stata Center houses MIT's computer science and artificial intelligence labs and certainly has got a cool design. However, in 2007, MIT filed a lawsuit for negligence against the building's architect after several design flaws and major structural problems were identified. More specifically, drainage issues caused walls to crack, massive icicles hung precariously during winter months, and mold even grew on the exterior walls, with the situation being so bad that repairs and alteration work cost the school more than one and a half million bucks. However, rather than go to trial, the two parties ultimately settled out of court. Number 12. The Kemper Arena Kemper Arena was the old home of the NBA's Kansas City Kings, and in 1979 it became infamous after a major storm with heavy rainfall and 110 km per hour winds caused much of the roof to collapse. According to reports, the main issue was that the roof was designed to release rainwater gradually so local sewer systems would not become overwhelmed. However, this caused the water to pool on top of the stadium, and this added weight made the roof too heavy to support itself when rocked by the wind. The end result was a massive collapse, and while some of the walls were blown out, the stadium was ultimately repaired and reopened within a year. Number 11. The Aeon Center Formerly known as the Standard Oil Building, the Aeon Center was completed in 1973 and fitted with 43,000 slabs of Italian Carrera marble. This made it the world's tallest marble-clad building, but this record was quickly taken away in the face of a disaster. That's because only one year after it was built, a 160-kilogram slab fell from the building, smashing into the roof of the nearby Prudential Center. It was later found that the marble was not suited for Chicago's sometimes extreme weather, causing it to crack and fall. As a result, the entire thing had to be refaced with Mount Airy white granite, at what today would amount to a cost of about $184 million. Number 10. The Death Ray Hotel When you go on a trip to Las Vegas, you generally expect to be able to sit back, relax, and do some gambling. However, if you do go on a trip to the Vidara Hotel and Spa in Las Vegas, you can also enjoy what's been nicknamed a death ray by staff, or more corporately, a solar convergence phenomenon by the management. You see, thanks to the building's curved glass exterior, the sun will cause extremely hot rays to burn parts of the pool area. While not actually deadly, the death ray can cause temperatures to increase by about 15 degrees Celsius, when it's already about 40 out, leading everything from severe burns to melted plastic bags. Thankfully, the area in question is quite small, only about 3 to 5 meters in diameter. However, the issue is, is that it moves across the pool deck as the Earth's rotation shifts and generally happens between the hours of 10.30 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. In a bid to mitigate this problem, MGM Resorts installed a thin film on the 3,000 glass panes facing the pool. This did help, as according to some reports, it diminished the death ray effect by up to 70%. However, it still didn't solve the problem. 
The next solution was to place a bunch of giant blue umbrellas over the pool deck, and this has reportedly also made a big difference. However, every so often, some of the light gets through, exposing people to hot, burning rays. However, what's kind of crazy is that Vidara's architect has taken little accountability for the whole thing. When asked to comment, he shrugged off the problem, blaming it on corporate indifference, because when he mentioned the potential problem to MGM, they didn't really care. Yet, given how annoying it's been to correct, I'm confident that MGM won't make that same mistake again. Number 9. China's Fast Food Homes Throughout the 1980s and 90s, China went through an economic boom, and up until the very recent housing market collapse, this created a phenomenon of so-called fast food homes. You see, the Chinese stock market is notoriously volatile, and so when rather than invest in the market, a large percentage of Chinese instead opt to buy real estate. For decades, this created massive real estate demand, and in order to keep up with this demand while maximizing profit, Chinese developers would create poorly built apartments and take dangerous shortcuts during construction. This has led to a number of collapses across China. One of the most infamous happened on June 27 of 2009 in Shanghai. You see, as part of the building plans, builders working on Block 7 of the Lotus Riverside apartment complex decided to dig out a 4.6 meter deep underground parking garage for the complex. This created a large pile of dirt, yet rather than move it to a secure location, it was brought to a landfill beside a creek. The weight of all this dirt then caused the riverbank of the creek to collapse, and as a result, the water began to seep into the ground beneath Block 7. This made the dirt surrounding the apartment very wet and muddy, making the ground too unstable to hold the apartment in place. On June 27th of 2009, this came to a head when the entire building came tumbling down, trapping and killing one unfortunate worker who was left inside. Another terrible collapse happened in the city of Fenghua in 2014. The story goes that despite there reportedly being cracks in the building, officials didn't respond to requests for repair. As a result, the entire building collapsed, trapping six people inside, one of whom died. So, while China may be a place with historically high growth and opportunity, living in many of its apartment blocks can be quite dangerous. Number 8. The CNA Tower While Chicago's bright red CNA Tower might be interesting and unique, on October 8th of 1999, an awful tragedy occurred thanks to a careless construction error. The story goes, on that date, a woman by the name of Anna Flores was walking by the building with her three-year-old daughter in hand when a jagged shard of glass fell from the 29th floor. Tragically, it smashed right into her, killing her while her young daughter held her hand. An investigation found that the entire thing was avoidable. It turned out that the building's windows had been cracking ever since it was first built in 1975, and the reason was because the window's glass could not withstand thermal stress. In fact, the cracking got so bad that someone was injured by falling glass in 1994, and at least one study suggested that the owners either pay for the building's windows to be replaced or reinforce them with a restraint system that would hold cracked glass in place until it could be fixed. However, they opted not to follow this advice, ultimately leading to Ana Flores' death when one of these damaged windows, which had already been cracked for four months, inevitably fell from its place. Unsurprisingly, this incident resulted in a general outcry from the media and the public. Once all was said and done, not only were the windows fixed, but CNA also agreed to pay $250,000 in fines and $18 million to Ana Flores' family in a settlement. However, the sad reality is, is that this decision provides little comfort to the Flores' family. However, as put by Ana's husband, Tony, quote, I certainly would not want something like this to happen to another family. For that reason, I'm glad that CNA has been forced to replace those windows. I only wish it had made this decision long before my wife was killed and taken away from me and my daughters." End quote. Moving on to number 7, 20 Fenchurch Street. 20 Fenchurch Street in London is a badly designed building in more ways than one. That's because its strange shape has not only caused it to be nicknamed the Walkie Talkie, but it's also been the source of both intense heat and staggeringly high winds. While it may be strange to think that just one building can be capable of so much damage, its faulty design is to blame. Since the building is concave in the middle, on hot days the skyscraper will reflect light off this concave point onto the street below. This heat is so intense that it's been recorded at a staggering 72 degrees Celsius, and it's managed to do everything from fry eggs and baguettes placed on the sidewalk to burn the top of a Park Jaguar convertible. As a result of this power, it's become quite the nuisance, and it's been nicknamed the Walkie Scorchy. To make matters a bit worse, it's believed that 20 Fenchurch Street is also behind an uptick in high winds. 
More specifically, experts believe that it's creating a downdraft effect which occurs when it hits the building and is forced downwards. In the case of 20 Fenchurch, the effect is so bad that it's knocked both people and street signs over on multiple occasions. While not publicly connected to this change, rumor has it that 20 Fenchurch was one of the major catalysts behind the decision to tighten rules on skyscraper building. Established in 2019, the new City of London rules instate a regime that includes more robust testing of roadways and pavement using detailed scale models in wind tunnels and computer simulations. In addition to this stricter testing, London has also reduced the level of wind conditions deemed tolerable, reclassifying average speeds of more than 8 meters per second as uncomfortable in all circumstances, and forcing developers to mitigate plans if designs are shown as likely to affect cyclists and pedestrians. So while 20 Fencher Street is badly built, at the very least it's become a catalyst for change. Number 6. The John Hancock Tower after being completed in 1976, the John Hancock Tower, which is more widely known as the Hancock, became one of the marvels of Boston's skyline. After all, its striking minimalist and modern appearance makes it one of the most visually appealing structures in the entire city, and it should have been a source of pride for years to come. However, the reality is, is that ever since its inception, its design problems has made it a colossal pain in the ass. The first major issue can be traced back to the building's construction. During the excavation for the tower's foundation, temporary steel retaining walls were erected. However, these walls warped, causing the clay and mud that the walls were supposed to protect against to damage utility lines, the sidewalk pavement, and nearby buildings. This led to repairs and lawsuits around the community, and while everything was ultimately fixed, it was a bad omen for what was to come. The second major issue was that the Hancock's foundations were not as secure as they should have been. This is because even in rather modest winds, the Hancock would sway back and forth in intervals of between 13 to 20 centimeters. This would make all those working inside have incredibly bad motion sickness. And so, in a bid to fix the problem, the owners of the tower had no choice but to put a tuned damper on the 58th floor. This acts as a counterweight whenever the building twists, keeping it from swaying too violently. However, since this was not enough to protect the building from any and all wind loads, 1,500 tons of diagonal steel bracing were also added to keep the tower secure. The third and perhaps most continuously aggravating issue has been the building's glass windows. Thanks to both the swaying of the building and repeated thermal stresses on the glass, the innovative blue glass panels that were supposed to surround the building would fall when the winds got too high. The situation was so bad that surrounding streets would have to be closed whenever wind speeds reach 72 kilometers an hour, and as a result, all 10,344 window panes had to be replaced with single-paned, heat-treated glass panels at a cost of what would today amount to be somewhere between 35 to 47 million bucks. Thankfully, all of these fixes have allowed the Hancock Tower to more or less remain stable until today. However, the design errors and the headaches these caused have made its journey a rocky one. Number 5. The Millennium Tower When the Millennium Tower opened to the public in 2009, it was pretty hyped up. After all, as soon as they were put onto the market, its more than 400 luxury apartments were quickly bought up by everyone from pro athletes to retired Google employees, netting the builders a reported $750 million. After all, it's the tallest residential school west of the Mississippi, and whenever there's a problem, a button can be hit that sends a repairman within 15 minutes. Yet what seemed like a great place to stay soon became anything but after it was revealed that the Millennium Tower was sinking into the ground below it. According to reports, as of now, it's sunk by 45 centimeters, is tilting 60 centimeters to the west and 20 centimeters north, and it's in such bad shape that there's been everything from creaking and popping sounds to cracks on supposedly hurricane-resistant windows. Now, the reason behind this sinking and tilting isn't totally clear. One problem may be the fact that the 18 to 27 meter long friction piles supporting the building were driven into sandy soil rather than bedrock. As a result, the ground that supports the tower is prone to liquefaction. While this is bad enough under normal circumstances, things can go from bad to worse during times of seismic activity, as the loose sand and silt could give way and lead to a partial collapse. Beyond the issue, some experts have also raised alarm bells that the fact that the drilling log shows a gap of one to four days between drilling and grout installation. This is critical because there's a very real chance that this could be behind the tilting. In any case, in order to fix the tower, a total of 18 concrete piles were sunk into the bedrock to act as support, with this coming in at a cost of $100 million. 
However, despite this high cost, many experts believe that the building is not stable enough to withstand an earthquake. You see, while the piles may in fact stop the sinking, the fact that they're only installed on two ends of the building mean that in the event of an earthquake, the building may rock so that it bangs into one corner and has a soft landing on the other, making the damage even worse than if there were no piles at all. As such, only time will tell whether or not this fix will actually work. Number 4. The King Dome While the King Dome may no longer stand today, it's easily one of the most notorious stadiums in American history. Located near Seattle, the Kingdom was opened in 1976, with the intention of it being the long-term home of Seattle's main sports teams, chiefly the Seattle Seahawks of the NFL, Seattle Mariners of the MLB, Seattle Supersonics of the NBA, and the Seattle Sounders of the former NAFL, or current MLS. For years, the stadium was used for nearly all of Seattle's main sporting events, and its massive dome was so huge that it held the record for being the largest reinforced concrete dome on the planet. However, despite being so well-loved at first, the King Dome soon began to fall out of favor. Fans began to complain that it was too small for football and not intimate enough for baseball. However, this proved to be the least of the stadium's worries after it became clear that there were some massive structural issues. In order to save a few bucks, the county had cut corners when constructing the dome, and this led to leaks forming even before the King Dome officially opened. Yet rather than fix the problems, the county instead decided to make haphazard repairs. And over time, these came back to bite them in the butt. You see, Seattle is known for being very rainy. This meant that quick repairs were not enough to hold off decades of continuous rain, and as a result, the stadium would continuously leak. In 1993, the county decided to strip the outer roof coating and replace it with a special coating in a bid to fix it. However, in what can only be described as an idiotic move, the contractor decided to pressure wash the new dome, causing water to seep through the roof. This made the many tiles on the roof unstable, and on July 19th of 1994, an incident happened where four 12-kilogram waterlogged acoustic ceiling tiles fell into the seating area while the Mariners were on the field preparing for a game. While no one was hurt, this type of incident easily could have turned deadly, and as a result, the game was canceled and the Mariners were forced to play on the road. And while millions were then spent on further repairs, it soon became clear that the stadium was too far gone to be properly fixed. In 1995, the decision was made to go ahead with the creation of a new stadium, and in 2000, the decision was finally made to demolish the kingdom. Despite its massive size, the entire thing collapsed in under 20 seconds, and to this day, it holds the world record for being the largest building by volume to ever be imploded. Number 3. The CCTV Headquarters while CCTV may not be well known to people in the West, it is famous in China for being one of the country's largest telecommunication providers. Serving more than a billion viewers in a total of six different languages, it is the vehicle that delivers a lot of media in China, and so it makes sense that this important company has a large scale and interesting headquarters. In essence, the structure is a loop of six horizontal and vertical sections and was built in three different phases. These phases were then joined together by a series of bridges, and at 473,000 square meters, it takes up so much office space that it's the second only to the Pentagon in terms of size. So upon its completion by architect Rem Koolhaas in 2012, this 51-story and 234-meter tall skyscraper certainly stood out. However, in the eyes of many, the skyscraper stands out for a number of negative reasons as well. This is because the building has a rather weird shape, and as a result, if you look at it from certain angles, it may certainly come across as a little bit lewd. After all, local taxi drivers refer to it as Dakucha, which roughly translates to big boxer shorts, and to some observers, it even looks like a pornographic image of a woman on her knees. Well, as you might expect, Kulhas denied this with the New York Times, instead suggesting that it was built in order to express the conflicting energies at work in society. Yet while these types of criticisms are already bad enough, it turns out that the CCTV tower also got in hot water while still under construction in 2009. That's because during this time period, an adjacent building in the complex known as the Television Cultural Center caught on fire after being ignited by an illegal fireworks display. This inferno that unfolded led to the near destruction of a neighboring hotel and the death of one fireman. As a result, 20 people were charged and sentenced for negligence. Despite all the negativity, it is worth mentioning that to some, the CCTV tower stands for positive change. 
You see, this headquarters was built along the lines of deconstructivism, which is a movement focused on breaking the rules of modern architecture. In fact, it was part of a greater movement by architect Kulhas to quote-unquote kill the skyscraper with the hope that new types of large buildings with more integrated, unique designs could shake up old conceptions of what a high-rise should look like. Now, the reality is that this whole kill the skyscraper thing ultimately failed. After all, not only have we seen widespread adoption of similar buildings, but we've seen moves to stop them from popping up, as Chinese President Xi Jinping famously criticized all the weird buildings being created in China in 2014 and put a ban on supposedly ugly architecture in 2021. Yet despite this failure, the CCTV headquarters is still a beacon of hope for many. Number 2. Ronin Point in the post-war period, there was a time of massive construction in England, and many new homes had to be built to house the families of the baby boom generation. Unfortunately, this rushed construction often led to poorly built homes, and as such was the case at Ronan Point. Named after Deputy Mayor of London Harry Ronan, it was part of the wave of tower blocks built in the 1960s as cheap, affordable, prefabricated housing, and used building techniques later known as the Larson and Nielsen system. Hailing from Denmark, this system consisted of the creation of standardized reinforced concrete elements. These elements were built in a factory, transported to the building site, and then assembled. In other words, the system was the closest thing you could get to an IKEA-style, assemble-it-yourself apartment building. Now, as you might expect, prefab buildings were not the greatest in terms of build quality, and this came to light just two months after the building's completion. More specifically, on May 16th of 1968, a resident, Ivy Hodge, went into the kitchen of her corner apartment on the 18th floor of the building and lit a match to light the gas stove for a cup of tea. The match sparked a gas explosion that blew out the load-bearing flank walls, which had been supporting the four apartments above. Since this made the floors above unsupported, this event led to a progressive collapse in the entire southeast corner of the building. While Ivy Hodge and her gas stove managed to survive the collapse, the residents above her were not so lucky, as a total of four died and 17 were injured in the blast. An investigation found that both the design and building quality were to blame. More specifically, shoddy materials used during the building process had caused a hard-to-notice gas leak in Ivy Hodge's apartment. While this was bad enough, what made matters worse was the fact that the building's walls were not built to withstand a strong blast or stay up if a lower wall gave way. The end result is a building that was far from safe to live in. The resulting outrage from this incident led to some pretty major changes in the building codes of the UK, United States, and Canada. One of the most substantial was to the British Building Code, was changed so that all buildings would be built to withstand pressures caused by wind forces, internal and external explosions, and vehicle incursions. It was also widely decided that while the Larson-Nielsen building system worked well enough for buildings of six stories or less, it was simply unsafe for buildings using the system to be extended past that point. It's also worth noting that when Ronan Point was demolished in 1986, it was found that the entire thing was built in a way that would have gone against the code of its day. According to architect Sam Webb, quote, not a single joint was correct, fixing straps were unattached, leveling nuts were not wound down, causing a significant loading to be transmitted via the bolts. Panels were placed on bolts instead of mortar, but the biggest shock of all was the crucial H2 load-bearing joints between floors and wall panels. Some of the joints had less than 50% of the mortar specified." End quote. So, I think it's fair to say, Ronan Point was a perfect example of what not to do when constructing an apartment building. Number 1. The Leaning Tower of Pisa Of all the building blunders out there, none are quite as famous or as old as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The tower traces its origins back to 1172 after a donation of 60 gold coins from a widow by the name of Donaberta di Bernardo kick-started construction. Although there is a disagreement as to whether Guillermo and Bonanno Paisano or Dito Slavi was the tower's architect, in either case their design was flawed from the start. Since the tower was built in an area with soil composed of clay, fine sand, and shells, the tower needed a very deep foundation. However, what can only be described as a disastrous mistake, the foundation of the building was just three meters deep. This was so woefully insufficient that when work began on the second floor, the whole tower began to sink and lean. Now, in most circumstances, the Tower of Pisa would have collapsed. However, in what ended up being a bit of a backward stroke of luck, Pisa then decided to go to war against Genoa, Lucia, and Florence almost continuously for the next hundred years. Now, while this may sound terrible, it ended up being a blessing in disguise because it allowed the soil around the tower to settle. 
As a result, the foundation became strong enough to hold up the tower, and in 1372, the structure was completed, a whole 200 years after construction began. While the tower would lean for centuries, it became much worse in 1838. Architect Alessandro Gerardesca decided that Pisa would benefit from exposing the base of the tower. This is because it was mostly buried underground and had a lot of intricate artwork that wasn't visible. However, as he began to dig, water came spouting out of the ground, causing the tower to tilt even more. This put it in even greater danger of falling. Well, things remained relatively stable until the Mussolini years. In 1934, Il Duce decided that the Leaning Tower was an inappropriate symbol for a masculine fascist Italy. In an attempt to reverse the tilt, engineers drilled holes into the foundation and tower and poured in about 200 tons of concrete. This proved to be an unmitigated failure, as all it did was make the lean even worse. Two further attempts to fix the tilt in 1964 and 85 just led to more leaning, and by the late 1980s, it seemed like the leaning tower was at imminent risk of collapse. As a result, the Italian government got down to business. In 1990, they closed the tower off to the public, and in 1992, attempted to temporarily stabilize the building. They did so by building these plastic-coated steel tendons around the tower up to the second story, keeping it in place so that more work could be done. In 1993, a concrete foundation was built around the tower, and as part of this foundation, counterweights were placed on the northern side to correct the tower's southward tilt. Since these counterweights were unsightly, the decision was made to reduce the tilt even more with the use of underground cables. While initial attempts actually made the tilt worse, in 1999, engineers came up with an ingenious system. By extracting the soil at a very slow pace, generally no more than four to eight liters per day, and using a massive cable harness to hold the tower in place, they were able to install the underground cables without damaging the tower. The results were incredible. Within six months, the tilt had been reduced by two and a half centimeters, and by the end of 2000, by about 30 centimeters. By the time the tower was reopened to the public in December of 2001, a 45 centimeter reduction had been achieved, returning the tower to its 1838 position. Experts believe that this essentially saved it from ruin, as it should be enough to keep it in place for at least the next 200 years. However, given the fact that it's sinking by a rate of about a millimeter per year, it's still on a slow and steady decline. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you to our channel members.